All right, good morning, church. Good to see all of you together. Good to hear your voices. It was uh, a joy to have uh, so many in our 9 o'clock gathering. Just, um, and then to have preschool families coming back and joining us in this way. So what a, what a privilege and a joy that is. I hope you got a Bible. We're going to study his word together. So if you would open to the Old Testament book of 2 Samuel, chapter 9. That's where we're going to be in 2 Samuel chapter 9. We are uh, closing up the Imago Day series, which we've been in these past five weeks. I hope it's been an encouragement to you as we've looked at God's Word and asking the question, what does it look like? What, is, what are the implications that we've been made in the image of God? And um, we're closing out this series today, but we are beginning a new series next week. We're getting into another Old Testament book, uh, the book of Jonah. So we've had... For these past several months, we've had more children in the room, which has been a joy and a blessing. And, uh, and so just thought, you know, if we're going to go somewhere in Scripture, why don't we go somewhere where, where there's a story? So this is the story of the big fish, if you're familiar. The big fish, but there's, there's a deeper story going on there about a story of relentless grace, and I hope that's going to be an encouragement to us. So uh, join us next Sunday as we start our Jonah series. All right, we're going to start reading. If you'd follow along with me, I'm going to read all of chapter 9 from 2 Samuel. David asks, so this is King David, is there anyone remaining from the family of Saul I can show kindness to for Jonathan's sake? So just pause there for a second. The house of Saul has fallen. They went out to battle. Saul died, army lost, Jonathan died, David's best friend, right? So the the house, the dynasty of Saul has fallen, and David is saying, is there anybody left in the family that I can be kind to for Jonathan's sake? There was a servant of Saul's family named Ziba. They summoned him to David, and the king said to him, are you Ziba? I am your servant, he replied. So the king asked, is there anyone left of Saul's family that I can show the kindness of God to? Ziba said to the king, there is still Jonathan's son who was injured in both feet. The king asked, where is he? Ziba answered the king, you'll find him in Lodebar at the house of Machir, son of Amiel. So King David had him brought from the house of Machir, son of Amiel, in Lodebar. Mephibosheth, son of Jonathan, son of Saul, came to David, fell face down and paid homage. And David said, Mephibosheth, I am your servant, he replied. Don't be afraid, David said to him, since I intend to show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. I will restore to you all your grandfather Saul's fields, and you will always eat meals at my table. Mephibosheth paid homage and said, what is your servant that you take an interest in a dead dog like me? Then the king summoned Saul's attendant, Ziba, and said to him, I have given to your master's grandson all that belonged to Saul and his family. You, your sons, and your servants are to work the ground for him, and you are to bring in the crops so your master's grandson will have food to eat. But Mephibosheth, your master's grandson, is always to eat at my table. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. And Ziba said to the king, Your servant will do all my lord the king commands. So Mephibosheth ate at David's table just like one of the king's sons. Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah, and all those living in Ziba's house were Mephibosheth's servants. However, Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem because he always ate at the king's table. His feet had been injured. So I I hope that one of the things we've been discovering along the way in this Imago Dei series is that... um, Imago Dei is not just, it's not just a, a, a doctrine that we internalize and bring into our thoughts and into our minds. Imago Dei, if it gets into the bloodstream of the church, is meant to create something beautiful. It is meant to adorn the gospel, to wrap the gospel in beautiful garments so that it looks compelling to the world because we're people transformed by Jesus. And I hope that for us as a church, we're a church that can talk about deep things. We've been talking about deep things these past five weeks, right? Hard things, really difficult, 
realities that we've been wading through these past several weeks. But I hope in our relationships, not just in our gathering, but in our relationships, we're people who can talk about deep things, hard things, where we can press into relationship and say, what's good, what's bad, and what's hard? Be real. What's going on in our lives where we dig into that, right? Where, where we could be a church where nobody has to fake it. Nobody has to put on airs. Nobody has to keep up appearances because the gospel welcomes us into an environment of grace, into a feast at the table of grace. That's what we see unfolding in this text. And there's a lot of hard things we've been talking about these last several weeks, but this is another one that we need to talk about. Paul Miller uh, has written a number of books. One of my favorite all times books and my wife's favorite book is A Praying Life. And it's a beautiful book about prayer because he's weaving biblical theology of prayer in together with the realities of life in a fallen world. And particularly, he's weaving it into the story of their efforts to care for their daughter, Kim, who is mute. She's, she has autism and struggled with autism. And, and so they unpack what does prayer look like? What does it look like to live a life of dependence on God in these kinds of circumstances? He writes this, in time, my wife Jill began to hate the dreaded charts that described what your child should be doing at what age. We were overwhelmed with a number of problems our daughter Kim had, and new ones just kept coming. Her eyes didn't focus. She had pneumonia. She had trouble breathing, especially in the winter, becoming listless when we turned on the heat. Her breathing problem was so pronounced that we used the last of our savings to convert to electric baseboard heat. For the next 20 years, we lived paycheck to paycheck. It was agony, especially for Jill. She had prayed God would keep Kim from harm, and we were holding a harmed child. At one point I told Jill, why don't you just give Kim to God? She told me, Paul, every day I take Kim up in my arms, walk her up to the foot of the cross, and then turn my back and come down again. Listen how real this is. It would have been easier for us if Jill had not prayed that Kim would be kept from harm. The promise of God actually made it worse. It hurt to hope. Do we have deep enough relationships and a, a Bible that's deep enough in the, in the thick of human struggle and suffering that we can process stuff like that out loud, out loud in front of one another together? without policing each other's vocabulary, right? How, how can we become a church? Let me ask you this way. How can we become a church where we see something more when we look at Kim than her disability? How can we become a church where we look at Kim and we see, first and foremost, the most prominent thing we see is an image bearer of a holy God that she is reflecting back in our direction the character of the king, the wonder of God's glory. How can we be a church where we flourish in her midst and she flourishes in our midst? Genuine reciprocity. She's making a difference in the church and we're making a difference in her life. And I'm not talking about the flourishing that depends on a physical miracle. We would love to see that. We love when there are breakthroughs of that kind. I'm not talking about the flourishing that depends on that kind of overt physical miracle. I'm talking about a flourishing that deepens our experience of community. I'm talking about a flourishing that evidences itself in the way that we care for one another, which is in a way the deeper miracle, isn't it? That's what we're talking about. So two truths in this text which have, I believe, profound implications for the way we treat image bearers who struggle with disabilities. Number one, we have experienced God's kindness. And you'll know there's been a pattern all along this series of that. Like what we've experienced, we're able to give. We become conduits of the grace that we ourselves have experienced. So you back up 2 Timothy and you get the broader context. 2 Timothy is a fascinating uh, record of events that transpired about 3,000 years ago, right? So if you come to the end of 1 Samuel, what happens there is, is it ends with the death of Saul, King Saul, and the death, the ending of Saul's dynasty, the death of Saul and David's best friend, Jonathan, Saul's son, 
That's what happens at the end of 1 Samuel. When you come to the first chapter of 2 Samuel, the first sound you hear is the weeping of the people, and nobody's weeping louder than David. He's not an opportunist. He's not saying, finally, I get that throne that I've been waiting for. No, he's lamenting the death of Saul and the falling of the house of Saul. Then you come into 2 Samuel chapter 5, and David is anointed king over Israel. Then you come into 2 Samuel chapter 7. This is a massive turning point in the entire Bible and in all of redemptive history because God makes a promise with David, the Davidic covenant. He promises him, and he says, your throne is going to last forever. I'm going to keep someone in your line on that throne to the end of time. Forever, someone will sit on your throne. And we know when we keep reading through the Bible that Jesus is the one who sits on the everlasting throne. He emerges. The very first words of Matthew's gospel indicate who this Jesus is. The one who's about to be born in Bethlehem is going to be the son of Abraham, and he's going to be the son of David. He's in David's line. He's going to be the king who rules forever. And Scripture urges us, even as we read in the Old Testament, Scripture urges us to see in the best parts of David's reign inklings of the coming reign of Jesus himself. We're supposed to look for that in the best moments of David's reign. We're supposed to see these are the things that grow in the garden of the gospel. These are the things that grow in the kingdom that Jesus rules. We see them in in narrow ways, in dim ways, but all the same, they're there. And this whole chapter, friends, is an, is an act of kindness. It's nested in that. Matter of fact, in my Bible, I don't know if you have it in yours, but the heading next to chapter nine is David's kindness to Mephibosheth. So we're gonna find out more about this man's life in just a minute, but the last verse of our passage, you see there, the last verse tells us he's physically disabled. It tells us he was lame in both of his feet. He was crippled in both of his feet. So this is the first point in our outline as we begin to retell the story. Mephibosheth was crippled for life. He was crippled for life. We, we find out what happened that would cause this, this guy to be crippled for life. Well, back in 2 Samuel chapter 4, verse 4, it says this. We'll have it on the screen. Saul's son, Jonathan, had a son whose feet were crippled. He was five years old when the report about Saul and Jonathan came from Jezreel. That is the fall, the, the loss of the battle. And his nanny picked him up and fled, but as she was hurrying to flee, he fell and became lame, and his name was Mephibosheth. So whether disabilities rise from birth or if they're caused by tragedy or caused by accident, in the case of Mephibosheth, the Bible comprehends the whole scope of human suffering. That's why... We get so much hope from the scriptures when we're walking through deep waters of pain. And David Pallison, the late brother who was an author and a president of Christian Counseling and Education Foundation, and he used to say that the Bible finishes all of our sentences in a fallen world. It, it gets us. There's an author named Andrew Wilson. He and his wife wrote a book about caring for their two daughters who had autism. And... Uh, And he says, you know, before I was 30 years old, I wondered why the Psalms were so full of pain and suffering and lament. And he said, by the time I was in my mid-30s, I wondered why there were so so many Psalms that weren't about pain and lament. The, The Bible speaks into the suffering of this world. You think about this this man's life, Mephibosheth's whole world changed in one day. He was five years old. He wakes up on any given Tuesday morning. He wakes up the son of a prince. He goes to bed that night. He's fatherless, and he's going to be a wheelchair for the rest of his life. And he doesn't know this, but he's under threat of a rising dynasty, because if you keep going, 2 Samuel, earlier, before our passage, you see the civil war between the dynasties of the house of Saul and the house of David, right? Oftentimes, when a new dynasty arose, they started looking for the sons of the former administration to wipe them out so that there would be no usurping and no uprisings, just in case you get any ideas. That's what happened back there. You have time you get to verse 12, this guy is not five years old anymore. We've moved down, down through time. He is old enough to have a son of his own, and we find out his son's name is Micah. And what becomes obvious in this text and many texts in the Old and New Testaments is that cultures both then and now had ways of foisting shame upon the disabled. 
Happens even in the New Testament when Jesus is walking around with his disciples. His closest followers. He's been teaching these guys. And they walk up on a man who's born blind and they say, what's the deal? Who sinned? Was it him or was it his parents? And Jesus says, are those my only two options? I don't like either one of those options. The answer is neither one of them sinned. This isn't a direct result of some disfavor from God on this man's life. Jesus rejected theology that assumed broken bodies reflect God's disfavor on a person's life or struggling minds reflect God's disfavor on a person's life. The church is called to reject that theology as well. Phibosheth was crippled for life. Second, he didn't expect blessing. Again, it's common to kill off anyone who belonged to the previous dynasty. And here's David. He's just mounted the throne. There's been a lot of civil unrest between his house and the house of Saul. And David says, are there any other children in the line of Saul and Jonathan? And look, by the time word gets to Mephibosheth, Somebody shows up at his door and knocks and they represent the king and they say, you need to come with us to the, to the king's court. What do you think Mephibosheth is thinking? He's not thinking table of grace, feast, it's gonna be awesome. He's thinking, this is it. I, 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 was, I was holed out in low day bar hoping he'd never find me. And now here's a man representing the king knocking on the front door and I get an escort back to the court of the king. And you can tell that that's his instinct because the moment he starts talking, David says, hey, you don't have to be afraid. I'm not doing what you think I'm doing. Don't be afraid. Mephibosheth comes in and all of his instincts are survival instincts. David says, Mephibosheth, when he walks in and he says, I am your servant. He's getting as low as he knows how to get. He falls on his face. He carries himself uh, with the bearing of someone who is inferior to another person. He designates himself in the lowliest terms possible. Verse seven, David says, don't be afraid, since I intend to show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. I will restore all your grandfather Saul's fields and you will always eat meals at my table. So David is saying, I got a different purpose. I'm about, it's Christmas. It's Christmas for you, Mephibosheth. And, and he doesn't buy it. In verse eight, he stoops even lower and he says, what is your servant that you would take an interest in a dead dog like me? You know, when the Hebrews in the ancient world called somebody a dog, that was one of the worst things they could possibly call you. They didn't like have dogs as pets. You know, that wasn't the, that wasn't the feel. It meant you're the, you're the outside, you're the outcast, you're the unclean. You're, you walk about in the streets where the dogs are, that's, that's you. And he says, ah, dog is too high. Well, how could you possibly show kindness to a dead dog? That's the ancient world's way of saying, I am utterly worthless. I have no value. I remember words that were spoken by probably an eight-year-old boy. Years ago, I sat down on the steps of the church after a gathering with him. In his earliest years of life, he didn't see any differences between himself and, and his friends, but as he got older, his friends were pointing out the things that were different about him and he started to become more self-aware that he had, he had these self-soothing habits that his friends in class thought were gross and they would point out that he did them and he couldn't stop doing them because it helped him to soothe in his own inner world and he became aware of this and as we sat down that day, he didn't hide his inner world from me. In six words, he told me what he sees when he looks in the mirror. I'm just a loser with habits. Probably eight years old. He doesn't see image bearer, stamp of a holy God, indelible worth. No, loser with habits. How do we embody the kindness of God? How do you talk to that boy? How do you reinform him about how God sees him and how we see him? Here's what happens in our text. David embodies the kindness of God. 
He embodies the kindness of God. Matter of fact, that word kindness is used three times in our text, in verse one, in verse three, and in verse seven. If you look at verse three with me, look at verse three. Is there anyone left of Saul's family that I can show, note those words, the kindness of God to? This is not David wanting to do a nice thing for somebody in need. This is not just some transactional thing. This is not his, his project. He wants to show the kindness of God. It's, it's, this word kindness, it's the word hesed. That is a famous word with incredible significance in the Old Testament because that is a word by which God says, that's what I am. I am the God of hesed. When Moses says, can I ask for the big one? Can I, can I ask something audacious? I want to see your glory. And what does God do in that massive moment of revelation? He tucks him into the cleft of a rock and he passes by and preaches the attributes of God as he moves by. And what does he say? He says, the Lord, the Lord, merciful and gracious, abounding in hesed, keeping hesed for thousands, keeping kindness. He is the keeper of covenantal kindness for thousands. He announces that on day one when he reveals himself to Moses. That's what I am. It's God in his deepest heart, a God of hesed. And this is not what Mephibosheth expected. He walks into the presence of the king believing he's an object of judgment. Moments later, he finds himself at the table of grace. That's what God is saying and showing us in this text. In that sense, this passage reminds us we shouldn't be surprised. It reminds us of the good news of the gospel itself. David's greater son who comes on the scene in the fullness of time. What's going on here? David's actions point us to Jesus Christ himself. Don't miss that. They point us to Jesus Christ himself and to what he has done for us. What did he do for us? Romans chapter five. God demonstrated his love for us in that while we were still sinners, outcasts, unclean, Mephibosheths, God pours out his love on us, brings us to himself through the cross of Jesus Christ. Jesus comes to redeem us from the curse of sin and death. What, what is that story of the gospel, right? We remember Jesus enters into the world. He comes, he lives a perfect life as a substitute. He dies, he hangs suspended between earth and heaven, absorbing the impact of God's justice against our sin on the cross. And he gives it. <laughs> he gives it to all who believe. All you do is believe and it's yours. The justification, the acceptance, the adoption as sons, it's all ours. Look, if that message is new to you this morning, or maybe if it's, maybe if it's not new to you, but it's just dawning on you as awesome. <laughs> if that's your experience, friends, it's time to believe. It's time to turn in the direction of the one savior and hope of the world and find in him a table of grace where you expected judgment. He's laid a feast of grace. And table looms large in our text as well. That shows up three times in our passage too. Verse 10, verse 11, and verse 13. Look at verse 11. So Mephibosheth ate at David's table just like one of the king's sons. What a reminder this is of the gospel of Jesus Christ the story of my life, your biography as a Christian is in this text. One of my favorite commentators, Old Testament commentators for sure, is a guy named Dale Ralph Davis. Outstanding Old Testament scholar. He writes a commentary on this book of 2 Samuel and here's his comment on our text. We are the Lord's Mephibosheths and there is absolutely no reason why we should be eating continually at the king's table. What a great salvation. What a glorious Christ. What he's done for us. We have experienced God's kindness. Would we bottle it up or will it spill over from our lives into the world? That leads us to the second point. We're called to display God's kindness. To display God's kindness. That's what's going on, right? David has experienced God's kindness and David says, do you know of anybody to whom I can show God's kindness? 
Luke 14, Jesus tells a parable of the great banquet, and he says, go out and invite them, and and what happens? They go out and they invite, and, and many don't come, and Jesus says, okay, go back again, and this time, go to the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind. What is Jesus saying? He's saying, find Mephibosheth. Bring him back here. Tables bending under the weight of the feast of mercy. I want him here to enjoy it. (laughs) What's the upshot for the church? This, Christians honor those the world dishonors. Christians honor those the world dishonors. The the movie um, came out some few years back, Me Before You, and it erupted in a swirl of controversy because of its views, the way the, the film portrays disabilities and the value of human life. So there's a, a man in a wheelchair who's the main character in the story, and he falls in love with his caretaker. It's intended to be an inspirational story, but it ends with him, the disabled man, ending his life through assisted suicide. The hashtag that was associated with this movie at the time was hashtag live boldly. That was the picture of living boldly. And there was an upsurge of response. One of the respondents, Ellen Clifford, an activist with the group Not Dead Yet, said this. The message of the film is that disability is tragedy and disabled people are better off dead. She put her finger right on the problem. What was the problem? There's no Imago Dei. There's no image of God being whispered into the soul of every human life. But look, here's the thing. Christians are different. We have this truth of Imago Dei, and it's resonating. It's bouncing off the walls of our inner man. We know this truth down in the core of our lives. And so our care for the disabled is a, is a good measure of our grasp of God's grace. For those here who've struggled with disability or struggle with special needs or family members who are walking with those who do, there's truth from God that speaks to you today. Here's one of them. Disability is not a core identity. Disability is not a core identity. One of the members of our church, and there are so many illustrations of this, beautiful illustrations of the way that believers in this church are already so engaged to love and care for those with special needs. And this woman does it professionally for over 20 years as a medical social worker and a number of other things, but she's also deeply involved in the work of the church, ministering to members of our congregation. Cynthia Murphy is her name. Here's how she speaks to image bearers with special needs. Quote, culture will tell you that you are deficient if you are anything less than self-sufficient. But the Bible tells us God is omniscient and our value is not defined by our ability to perform. She gets it. Gets what? Imago Dei. She gets the big idea. Our value is not defined by our ability to perform. What do we see when we look at somebody who has special needs or someone who struggles with disability? Answer, we see God's glory. Reflected back, we see something of his character, something of God's compassion, something of his tenacity, something of his long suffering. Look, when we grasp Imago Day, what do we do as a church? We move toward people with love, with care, with friendship. We display inclusion without making people a project. We take interest, we learn. Disability is not a core identity. The next one is this the things that make life hard won't last forever. What does the psalmist say to those with all manner of suffering? Weeping may endure for the night, but joy comes in the morning. This is the blessed hope that has fueled the perseverance of God's people for 2,000 years. The Apostle Paul, he describes the great day of the resurrection in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and he says that bodies that are currently, here's these three descriptions, bodies that are currently perishable, dishonorable, and weak, will be raised imperishable in glory and power. 
That, that's where the story's going. That's where the trajectory of God's people is going. Andrew and, and Rachel Wilson, they've written an outstanding book on the journey of, of what it's been like for them to care for their two daughters who have autism. And, and they're reflecting on the phrase that we sing every Christmas. He comes to make his blessings flow far as the curse is found. Here's their reflection. Far as the curse is found. Like the spring thaw turning sheets of ice into fresh running water, the power of God will extend to every square inch of this world and turn every curse into a blessing. The tube fed will enjoy home cooking. The wheelchair bound will go water skiing and climb mountains. Those who cannot speak will sing and describe and discuss. There will be no need for words like syndrome or degenerative and no place for DNA testing, epilim, ritalin, hydrotherapy, or physical therapy. Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, fallen, broken, Adam, so we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. We will have resurrected bodies just like that of Jesus, bodies that can eat, cook, walk, and socialize, and yet somehow rise indestructible, never grow old, and never decay. Oh, autism, where is your victory? Oh, cerebral palsy, where is your sting? That's Christian hope. That's powerful. Johnny Erickson Tata is a Christian woman who has lived with quadriplegia for over three decades. A diving accident when she was 17 years old left her paralyzed from the neck down, can't feel anything from the neck down. She writes into this space so beautifully and she started a ministry years ago called Johnny and Friends where she ministers to people with disabilities. Here's what she says about the blessed hope. I sure hope I can bring this wheelchair to heaven. I hope to bring it and put it in a little corner. Then in my new perfect glorified body, standing on grateful glorified legs, I'll stand next to my Savior and I will say, Jesus, do you see that wheelchair? You were right when you said that in this world we would have trouble because that thing was a lot of trouble. But the weaker I was in that thing, the harder I leaned on you. And the harder I leaned on you, the stronger I discovered you. To be. She goes on to say, then she'll say to Jesus, now you can cast it into hell. <laughs> so Brooke Hills, what does, this, what does this mean for us? How can we care for image bearers with special needs? Three very brief words. Number one, study their season. Study their season so you'll know what's helpful and you'll know what's not helpful. Two, pursue. So study and then pursue. Pursue members of the church who have or are affected by special needs, the journey of disability. Befriend them. Invite them to your home, to your table. Invite them to your small group. Befriend, right? Step in closer. Pursue them. Number three, help. So very practically, go to brookhills.org slash special needs and consider volunteering, becoming a buddy. Or short of that, commit to pray for one or two families in this church. Pray for them regularly. I got an email from a dear woman in our congregation who's been caring for her son who has special needs. Care for him is such a full-time thing that she's not been able to come to church in over six years. She said, thank you for live streaming because I haven't been in church in six years. He has seven or eight seizures a day. And she said, you know, you know what's a huge blessing is knowing my church is praying for me. Prayer matters. Let them know you're praying for them. I'll close with this quote from Andrew and Rachel Wilson. I have no idea of the extent to which either or both of the children will reach destinations like independent living. I have absolutely no clue as to how to raise an autistic teenager. I cannot imagine how we will cope with aggression or frustration when the children are older or how we will teach them life skills. The idea of Zeke and Anna becoming adults is virtually unimaginable to me. 
Yet what we've tried to convey in this book is that as uncertain as our voyage is, there are solid landmarks ahead that are knowable and concrete because of the captain. I know that the future will include the grace, blessing, and goodness of God. I can be confident that he will provide for us and for them. I know he will sustain us all. I know he will journey with us to the very end, at which point everything that is perishable and incomplete will be gloriously resurrected and healed. So I fix my eyes, not on what is seen, but on what is unseen, and I take a deep breath. And that last statement is what I pray happens at Brook Hills. That this is a community in which you can come and you can breathe. You, you can find a safe place to unburden your soul. You can be honest about the struggle, honest about the battle to keep trusting in Jesus where we, where we have steady supplies of hope for weary people. That's, may that be the Church of Brook Hills. May it be a place where we got a big table of grace and we invite you into it to come and dine. And then we go out and we make room for more.